Earlier in his career, Eric Levin developed and ran the first electronic system for keeping score on the popular PBS game show, The Pennsylvania Game. Boy, has he come a distance from then. Today, he's a visual effects supervisor in Hollywood. His film credits include Armageddon, My Favorite Martian, and Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. We talked with Eric about the role of visual effects in film today. I understand that you were discovered at a film festival and that your first employer actually sought you out rather than the other way around. Tell us a little bit, of how, a bit about how you became an animator in the film business. Um, well, I started screwing around with computers at school and I was a film student here at Penn State and I realized that I could use computers to make my own sets and characters and actors and do it for free, you know, whereas normally making film projects cost a lot of money. You don't have to pay for film stock or anything if you do it on the computer. So. I started making short films in the computer as well as my live action films and you know when you make a film you get into a festival and uh, yeah somebody saw it at a film festival and called me up the day after spring break my senior year and I, I couldn't believe it I mean they were offering me a job I wasn't, hadn't even graduated I, I was convinced I was never going to be employable as a film student. Um, because you were having too much fun. Right and that's not the kind of thing that you normally get paid for. So. And, yeah. and in fact you, you later went on and, and still do work with Phil Tippett who of course is known for uh, his special effects. In fact he won Academy Awards for Jurassic Park and The Empire Strikes Back. What was it like working for someone who you had previously been in awe of? Uh, it was amazing. I mean, you know, when you first meet the guy, you know, you're, you're really literally in awe and you don't want to, oh, my name's Eric and, I, yeah, hey, I'm Phil. Oh, I know, I know, you know. <laughs> and then you find out he's just a regular guy and he's, you know, gruff and doesn't always shave and, you know, he bosses you around and, uh, and he's great. And he, he and I see film and special effects in the same sort of way, I think, and that special effects are just a tool to help the story and they're not sort of the end-all, be-all science projects that a lot of people have made them out to be. So, you know, we sort of use them to kind of you know, advance the story and show some neat stuff, but not necessarily, you know, focus on the special effects and really study the special effects. We often, we both say, if, if something doesn't look right, you know, throw some dust in front of it to help it along or something like that. You don't have to worry about the whatever radiosity of the, you know, who knows what, you know, fancy terms. So, so you might agree with someone like the critic for the Chicago Tribu uh, Tribune who said that special effects can suck life, life from a movie. Yeah, I think that these days, because more and more stuff is possible, you end up not coming up with ways to make it interesting. Um, if you look at the films that were made before digital technology, they were constantly battling, you know, uh, how can we make this work? What, what kind of cheats can we do to make this stuff work? And they'd come up with interesting solutions because they're limited. Um, you know, Phil has a saying, you know, for some of the lower budget movies that he's worked on, you know, the bad news is we've got no money, but the good news is we've got no money. And you end up coming up with some really creative solutions and coming up with some interesting special effects. Um, Jaws is the best example where, you know, Jaws was this big shark movie and they realized, you know, oh geez, the, the shark doesn't work. So what are we going to do? Well, let's, let's not show the shark until, you know, until we absolutely have to. And of course that made the movie so much more scary. So that's the kind of stuff we like to do. Is it accurate to say that almost anything that can be imagined today can be put on the screen? Uh, if you want to pay for it, yeah. And that's really where it comes down to. I mean, you know, if you can get the movie studios to shell out the money, then there really are no limits. Um, but the stuff is expensive and it does take time. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. They figure, well, with computers, we can do anything. So why don't you guys just do it? Well, you know, you still need artists and craftsmen to, uh, to make this stuff happen. So. Sky Captain and, uh, and the World of Tomorrow was filmed completely without a set. It was the actors were standing in front of a blue screen. Where will, will computer generated uh, imagery take us in the future? I mean, will there someday be uh, digital actors and actresses? Uh, the digital actor thing is something that a lot of people talk about and a lot of people are really interested in, but it feels like they're interested in it as a science project and they want to do it just to see if they can do it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good thing to do. I think if you look at a lot of the digital set movies like the Star Wars, the new Star Wars movies and Sky Captain, they really have an interesting look but they will often be sort of bland and dry because the actors are reacting to nothing all the time, which is hard to do for an actor, you know. Um, if Gwyneth Paltrow is being told, you know, there's a giant monster right there, you have to look scared, you know, there's only so much she can do, you know, take after take after take in a situation like that. Now, Starship Troopers, uh, the action thriller, was uh, nominated for an Academy Award for its uh, for best effects, something that you worked on. Can you kind of in simple terms explain to us how, for instance, that bug creature comes to life on the screen? Uh, sure. Well, um, it's done basically uh, through, it, it's kind of like the stop motion where in the old days you used to have an actual puppet that was about two or three feet high and you'd move it a little bit at a time and then, uh, you know, a little bit at a time per frame, just like King Kong. 
uh, and then when you played it back, it would you know appear to move. So these days we do the same thing, but with computers. So you have a digital model that's you know three dimensional inside the computer. An animator will move it a little bit at a time. The computer will sort of fill in the in between frames, um, and then it's composited into the live action. Uh, we sort of place it right on top and make it look like it's in the same world. And in fact, we have a clip of you uh, creating or, or turning a green ball of goo into one such bug creature. Yeah, um, the green ball is used for reference. So the cameraman, you know, this actually, that's a tail of the bug, of the spy bug, and that, the green ball part is the head. Um, and now you can see here that the, uh, the animator has started to rough in, you know, the digital version of that. Um, now some TD, technical directors have started to digitally light it so that it looks a little more realistic. Um, and then here the process is refined, we add digital goo. Uh, until here, which is, this is the final shot. Um, it goes through many, many iterations. A shot like this, which is, what, three seconds long, will probably take three to six weeks to complete. Um, you know, there are probably a crew of six people working on that one shot, and they'll go through literally dozens of iterations until it looks right. Of all of the work that you've done to date, can you tell us which you're most proud of and which you'd kind of like to backspace and delete? Uh, well, backspace and delete. I mean, in my job, you know, um, I'm you know I'm part of a crew and often a very large crew. So uh, working for a company like Tippett Studio, I don't necessarily get to decide what movies I work on. Um, so every movie has its own set of challenges. We don't have a lot of input in terms of what the final product is going to be. So, for example, a movie like Hollow Man, which was a lot of work and a lot of you know a lot of Saturdays and a lot of late nights, and then you see. The ultimate product, you know, fantastic special effects, but the film not the greatest movie. Geez, you know, kind of kind of a bummer to see that. And then uh, my favorite film was for me was the one I just finished, which was Starship Troopers 2, um, which was great because it was a low budget film, and we really had it was a small crew, and everyone enjoyed working with each other. So we really got a lot of input with the filmmakers, I and mean, we felt like we were making a film. You know, it wasn't just like a, a bunch of craftsmen working on a, you know, a crew of 800 people. It was it was. Uh, you know, really collaborative effort. Speaking of uh, Starship Troopers 2, there is a, a mini documentary at the end of that DVD. And so audiences get to see what it's like behind the scenes, how you create these special effects. I'm wondering how, knowing how it's done, whether it's spoiled going to the movies for you. Well, I had always tried to figure out how the special effects were done, and my feeling is uh, if the movie's a good movie, you don't even think about it. You're watching this stuff, and all of a sudden a giant monster comes and attacks somebody or, or whatever. It, it's amazing. You don't even think about it. If the movie is crummy, that's when you start to, you know, geez, I wonder how they did that, you know, and that's when your mind starts to wander. Um, so ideally, the movie's good. You don't have to worry about it. With just a couple of seconds remaining, how does your work for the Pennsylvania game rank among your achievements? I was really excited about the Pennsylvania game, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that. It was some of the first computer stuff we'd ever done, so it was, it was very exciting. All right, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Levin says that Tippett Studio doesn't worry about the latest high-tech trends when it comes to animation. In fact, they often choose good old duct tape and bubble gum over a lot of high-tech solutions. Eric's newest film, Mask 2, will be out in February. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.